guys if you're seeing this on youtube you guys are catching the live replay i'm currently live on tiktok so let's see what questions that people have for us today Welcome, welcome, welcome to all the people joining. I'm answering astrology questions, questions about your natal charts. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to comment below. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all the people joining. I'm answering astrology questions. So if you guys have any questions about astrology or your natal charts, feel free to comment below. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all the people joining. I am answering astrology questions. So if you guys have any questions about your natal charts or astrology, feel free to comment below. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all the people joining. I am answering astrology questions, questions about your natal charts. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to comment below. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all the people joining. I'm answering astrology questions, questions about your natal charts. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to comment below. Hi, Frequency of Free, how are you doing? Hi, Jazz, how are you doing? Welcome to all the people joining. I'm answering questions about astrology and your natal charts. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to comment below. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all the people joining. If you guys have questions about your natal charts or astrology, feel free to comment below. How do you get a Taurus to budge? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> they're so stubborn. They're so fixed. They're probably not going to change their minds. And it's unfortunate because it's like they kind of operate with blinders on sometimes. So it's like because they think their way is the only way, there could be an easier way to do something, but they don't see outside of that. That's all fixed signs, they're all like that. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all the people joining. Let me know if you guys have questions about your astrology, charts, natal charts, astrology in general. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Welcome, welcome to all the people joining. I'm answering astrology questions, natal chart questions, anything you guys would like to know, feel free to comment below. Hey, Caitlin, you said, what does it mean to have Aquarius Venus in the air? I think the Aquarius energy is going to be detached, but the eighth house energy is going to be kind of possessive so it's kind of like a counterintuitive energy like when it comes to your friendships like okay when it comes to your friendships you could be detached in the beginning but if you get attached to the person you could become like very possessive like that's something that can take place and it might take you a while to get there and you might hide that about yourself jazz says two degree thank you for the gift oh my gosh that's so cute two degree jupiter in aries eighth house thanks so much for the likes you guys 
anything about spouse characteristics. Jupiter and Aries in the eighth house. It's interesting, yes, the eighth house can tell you about your spouse. When you have Aries in there, it'll be a person who has Aries-like qualities. So this individual can be maybe selfish or just very independent, maybe like a manager, um, not your manager, but like this person can do that as a job, or maybe they can be into entrepreneurship, uh, very independent type of vibe. With After marriage or like long-term commitment, what can happen is you can develop more of like a confidence, strong solar plexus, identity, like this person can really push you in that direction as well. Hey everyone, welcome for joining. I'm just going in order. Frequency of free, let me go see if your question went through. I am going in order. No, I didn't see any questions from you. That's the only message that I saw from you when you said hello and when you said, did my question go through? Okay, Sophia says, hi Barbara, what are your thoughts on, about a triple earth chart? Does this person have a lot of earth energy in their natal chart? Is that what you're asking? Jazz says Taurus, L-M-A-O-O. -O. User 56114848, etc. says, what does it mean if your second house is ruled by Aquarius but has a Capricorn placement too? Are you looking at Placidus? Is maybe Capricorn intercepted in your natal chart? Do you have maybe um, Aquarius occupying two houses? Double check and let me know. Welcome to all the people joining. Thanks so much for the likes, you guys. Like Taurus, Rising, Virgo, Moon, Capricorn, Sun. Yeah, you're going to be very earthy. It's going to be very easy for you to operate on this earth plane. You're going to be very practical. You're going to be very much about like the wealth and getting money. You're going to be hardworking. It's very easy for earth placements to operate down here. You guys are very practical in terms of your approach. You guys know what you want. You guys are kind of like, okay, this is how I'm going to go about getting my goals. Virgo is going to be all about the day-to-day, -day, the routine, all about like, okay, I'm going to practice until I get there. Practice makes perfect. I'm going to perfect my craft. I'm going to perfect my goals. Taurus is going to build. They're patient in that sense, right? They're slowly getting to where they're trying to get to. And then Capricorn likes the wealth. Like it's a very, very nice combination. JYT says, you have sixth house Aries sign and Jupiter will the eclipse and the eclipse will be in Aries. Any thoughts? Yes. So it's going to affect your sixth house. So this could be anything to do with health, healing, and being of service. In terms of the sixth house, probably like, let's say if it's like a plastic surgery or something of that sort, like if you can avoid it during that time, maybe to avoid it. I'm not answering predictive questions. I'm only answering questions about your natal charts, astrology, and any questions you guys have about astrology. Welcome to all the people joining. Let's see. If you guys have any questions, feel free to comment below. Oh my gosh, thanks so much for the likes, you guys. You're welcome, Sophia. Let me know if you guys have questions about astrology, about your natal charts, or astrology in general. You're welcome. Thoughts on Gemini, Sun, Aries, Moon, and Sag rising. You're welcome. You could be very impulsive. Okay, so something to keep in mind. Impulsive in terms of like, I want to start this, I want to start that, and then maybe you don't see results and then you drop it. You might not even know where to start. You might be very scattered. And then in the earlier part of your life, you're probably going to be the type of person who's like, I want to do this thing and I want to do that thing. You're going to kind of be all over the place with the Sag rising. You're going to have a lot of friends. Uh, with the Aries, Moon, you're definitely going to be learning conflict management, um, regulating your emotions and your anger as well. Okay, frequency of free, I see your message now. You said, what is the difference between the sun and Mars energies and how to use each one? Good question. Because both of them are actually masculine energies. And it's interesting because I was listening to someone speak about esoterica and they were saying that the sun actually used to be feminine. But anyways, in terms of astrology, the sun is considered to be masculine. It's considered to be your father as well. So the sun is going to be your ego. Okay. So it's kind of like your identity. It's going to give you the idea as to how you handle masculine energy. And it's like what you learn from the father because the sun can represent the father. So maybe you picked up on traits from the father. So like, let's say you have a son and like 
water um, signs, you're probably going to have a more so feminine energy leaning father, which then in turn means that your, your masculine energy is probably suppressed or something of that sort. Let me know what you have in each one. Mars is all about how you go after things, okay? So it's your masculine energy being directed. So that's kind of the difference. So it's like when we look at the solar plexus, right? That's going to be your ego. It's going to be your identity. So it's like it's where you have boundaries. You have strong boundaries. It's kind of like these types of masculine traits, whereas Mars is actually putting things into action. Welcome to all the people in their lives. I guess this is like a new thing on TikTok. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you guys have questions about your natal charts, feel free to comment below or astrology in general. Twenty ninth degree Taurus Mars mean that is an intense placement. Were you the individual who had the Aries moon as well? I'm just going back up. Yes, that was you. Very interesting. You know, Taurus at the 29th degree is definitely very challenging. Okay, all of the signs when they're at the 29th degree, it can go into the shadow of that particular sign. Okay, that's something to keep in mind. So the question is, what is the shadow of Taurus? They can be petty. They can be very much, you know, like um, even if they have money, they might not share it or they might make people feel around them. Like, let's say you're in a family dynamic, you might make people feel like there's no money, like you're in a scarcity. That's kind of the Taurus energy when it's in the shadow. Also, they can be very like rigid okay, in terms of their beliefs, things that, you know, they um, think to be true and things like this, because it also does deal with the belief. So that can be something that does take place when you have 29th degree Taurus Mars and then you have it in the Mars. So once again, there's a theme coming up for you in terms of anger management, conflict resolution, not being overly like explosive, maybe figuring out an outlet for your anger and your emotions, uh, maybe exercise would be very, very helpful for a case like this to just get the energy out there. Welcome to the people joining. I'm answering astrology questions. So let me know if you guys have any questions about your natal charts. or astrology in general. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all the people joining. I'm answering astrology questions, natal chart questions. Let me know below if you guys have any questions about your natal charts. Hey, Ebony, how are you doing? You said any thoughts on upcoming Aries eclipse season? You have moon conjunct ascendant in Aries. The thing is, whenever there's an eclipse, there's things that are going to be coming to the surface. That's the whole thing here. So it's like, you know, maybe certain secrets come to the surface or maybe certain traits of yours come to the surface that you didn't know were there. So what I can suggest is see what house you have Aries in and it's going to be affecting that house. It's going to be bringing out things to the surface in terms of that house. Let me know what house you have it in. I'm actually curious. Let's see. So frequency of free says, so sun is more expressing and Mars is more physical action. Yes, absolutely. Sun, Scorpio in the 12th house. Okay. See, that's interesting because that adds a different layer to the story because it's like now when you have sun and Scorpio in the 12th house, it's more so feminine energy leaning. 12th house sun can be an absence of a father figure. So it could be mental, emotional, or physical absence. I will get to your question shortly, Sophia. Um, so that could be something that just take place. I've noticed people who have sun in Scorpio can sometimes have like cutthroat fathers or like fathers who are very like blunt or just like, you know, like absent in that sense where it's like maybe they don't have a sense of emotions and emotional intelligence and these types of things. Like I've noticed that for sun Scorpios that can take place sometimes. I've also noticed sun Scorpios to sometimes be masculine energy leaning as well, which is actually interesting because Scorpio is more so a feminine side sign. But I think what takes place is like, because Scorpio energy can go into emotional unavailability and repression of emotions. So that could be something that does take place because you're learning that from the father. And then you have Mars and Virgo in the 10th, which is like, it's a grounded way. I like that energy in terms of expressing the go-getter action. It's not overly um, impulsive. I like having the earth signs in the Mars because it's like, you're more practical in terms of your approach. 
Sophia says, in your opinion, what is the most significant significant compatibility placement? What do you mean by this? Welcome to the people joining. If you guys have questions about your natal charts or astrology in general, feel free to comment below. Thanks so much for the likes, you guys. Taurus, Mars in the fifth house. So when it comes to expressing your creativity, you could be practical in your approach. You could very much be motivated by money, by wealth, by creativity overall. The fifth house can also deal with children. Fifth house can mean maybe that your children are going to be very like grounded, these types of things as well, which is really, really interesting that that's coming through dimension. But overall, Mars is how you handle conflict. So when you have Taurus in there, you could be also maybe the type of person who holds a grudge when it comes to conflict. That could also take place with the Taurus Mars. But in terms of like going after things, being a go-getter, you're probably going to be very grounded, like slow and steady wins the race. That's the whole thing with the Taurus energy. It's slow in the sense where it's like, it's practical. It's like, sometimes I see Taurus energy like, a bull with like four feet on the ground you know it's like one foot in front of the other i'm eventually going to get there and then creativity is going to be very motivational for you mars feels really directed in virgo you don't know how it feels anywhere else but you like it in here yeah i like it in there as well i like the i very much like the earth signs and the mars because it's like the fire signs in mars can be some of them can be impulsive some of them can be like very masculine in terms of their approach the earth signs and the Mars can be very practical, very much like, you know, logical. If you have Virgo in there, you're really going to think things through. You're going to, again, put one foot in front of the other, like practice something, perfect something like that's very much Virgo energy. And it operates very well on this earth plane. Let's see. Frequency of free said, thank you. That was accurate, blunt, distant dad, and more masculine in physical appearance. Have no that does tend to take place. Sophia says, you mean it's not everything, but you were looking into significant others. Are you talking about synastry? Let's see. Tats Demi says, Capricorn, second house, Neptune is in there too. Really interesting. Capricorn in the second house is nice in terms of going after your finances. It's something that probably you're going to be rewarded later on in life. That's kind of Capricorn energy. It basically takes some time to build what it is that you're trying to build and you're trying to build wealth. That's the thing. The Capricorn energy is all about building wealth. They are all about elevating their financial status. So it's going to take time. That's important to understand. And you're always going to be like very much, you know, interested in jobs that are going to achieve you that type of status that you're seeking. If it's not like the job, then it's going to be a job where you are surrounded by these types of people. Interestingly enough, who's coming to mind is that Anna Delvey girl. Anyways, she was also coming through earlier, which is really, really interesting. Having Neptune in there, though, there's something you don't see clearly here. Neptune in the second house could be illusions surrounding your finances. So it's like, you know, having Capricorn is nice, right? And the Neptune, and you're probably part of the generation that I personally find is going to start getting activated as soon as Pluto is officially in Aquarius. So people who have Neptune and Capricorn, a lot of you guys might also have Uranus and Capricorn, but for this subset of the generation, you guys are going to kind of get a taste of what the next you know, cycle, the next Pluto cycle, which is going to be, I think, like 19-ish years, is going to look like in these next few weeks while Pluto is in Aquarius because Capricorn was hitting all of these placements for you. So it's like a lot of these people probably felt like, oh, I'm building towards something and nothing's happening. And, you know, they kind of have like a self-image where it's like they, they feel like they should be in higher positions, but nothing was coming into fruition. So I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that from 20... 24 onwards. Hey, Lucas. Oh my gosh. Hi. Yes, I am back. How are you? I'm happy that you're here. Let me know if you have questions about your natal chart or astrology. Okay. Ebony says, is it true that people with Gemini Mars retrograde in a natal chart are unable to get angry? Yes. Okay. So when you guys have retrograde in your natal chart, and it's actually more common to have retrograde in your natal chart than not. So when you have retrograde in your natal chart, you experience the energy more so internally. So people, when you have, so when people have Mars retrograde, what can take place is they can experience the anger more so internally, and then they can become explosive or they can express it at strange times. 
same thing with their motivation, right? Like they can kind of like spend a long time like thinking, thinking, thinking about what they want to do. And then they finally do it, but it's like, it comes out like a, a burst of energy. Like that's kind of like retrograde energy in the natal chart. You're welcome. Let's see. Sophia says, chart, would you look at moon compatibility first? For example, sent that first separate. Sophia, can you write your whole question at once? Welcome to all the people joining. Frequency of free says you have Capricorn and the second two with moon is sure taking time. Yeah, that's the thing because it's like, okay, people who have Capricorn energy in their natal chart, like they just know that they are here to be some sort of within the system. So whether it's like lawyer or judge or government, like whatever it is, whether it's within or whether it's out of it in terms of starting their own businesses and doing their own thing, like they know that, but it's like, it takes time. That's the struggle with Capricorn Saturn energy is something that it basically makes you work. That's the thing. Saturn energy makes you work. That's the whole thing here. Derica says North node in Sagittarius, Aquarius, Sun, Aries, Moon, Pisces, rising career ideas. Can you tell me what house you have your Sagittarius North node in? Aquarius, Sun, Aries, Moon, Pisces, rising. <laughs> It'll be something creative with the Aries moon. You could be interested in being like the best at something and whatever it is that you're doing. You could also be interested in something spiritual, something ahead of its time, inventions, maybe even things to do with like the internet, things like this, like anything that's like futuristic. Let me know what house you have it in. Lucas says, you would love to know my interpretation of Capricorn 12th house. Uranus is in your ascendant in Aquarius, Capricorn 12th house. So, this is the thing with the 12th house for everyone in their natal chart. 12th house can tell you a lot of things, actually. It can tell you how you unconsciously behave. So it's like you have an ascendant. Okay, your ascendant is in the sign of Aquarius, right? That's your first house, and that's how you're presenting to the world. But you have Capricorn in the 12th house. So it's like you behave like a Capricorn without realizing. So it's like you might be interested in going after goals and going after money and going after wealth. But it's like it might throw people off, right? Because it's like, wait, hold on. Because with the air, with the with the Aquarius energy in the first house, you could kind of be like very like likable. You know, you could have a lot of friends. You could be very humanitarian, philanthropist. But it's like the Capricorn 12th house is like kind of pushing you to go after wealth, to go after status to go after these things. So whenever you have something in the 12th house, whatever's occupying in your 12th house, it can tell you how you unconsciously behave, okay? So you unconsciously behave like that particular sign. It can also tell you about your past lives as well. So when you have Capricorn in the 12th house, in a past life, you could have been this type of person that was climbing the social status ladder, like these types of things. Mercury and Scorpio in the 12th house. Oh my gosh, I love Mercury and Scorpio. I talk about it all the time. Like I love that place sign because I find them to be very emotionally intelligent. They're very intellectual in terms of, they're always playing chess. That's the thing. Mercury and Scorpio is always playing chess. They always know, let's say even what the other person is going to say. So it's like, even in terms of like conversation, sometimes they're already calculating their response based on what the other person is about to say to them, based on what they said first. Do you know what I mean? Like they're always playing like chess, but it's like, you want to take this to your advantage, right? Because sometimes it can go into the shadow where it's like they're kind of using this to manipulate. But sometimes you have to manipulate. You know what I mean? Like let's say you're at a job interview you are obviously going to be like, you know, formulating a response to get the job. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, how do you apply this energy? Let's see. You're welcome. Sagittarius in the 10th house. Oh, very nice. So you're probably going to if it's aspecting your midheaven. Pluto in Sag in the 12th house. Yes. Another thing with the 12th house, wherever you guys have 12th house in your natal chart, it's like whatever planets you have in there, if you have planets in there, you're clearing up that karma in this lifetime from a past life. That's another thing with the 12th house. It's like, first of all, it's residual energy. It's something that you didn't get to complete. And also you're completing it in this past, in this current lifetime. It's interesting, it's coming through as past life. So in a past life, what could have happened when you have Pluto and Sag in the 12th house is like, maybe you like just finished transforming and boom, you weren't able to complete your purpose in that lifetime for whatever reason. You know, so you come through to complete that transformation. Also, because Pluto deals with transformation, you're going to be going through transformations in terms of the 12th house. So it's in terms of your psychic gifts, in terms of the metaphysical planes, in terms of your ideas and all these things. Pluto and Sag is the whole Gen Z generation. Okay, May Eve says, your North Node and Pluto in the fourth house 
with Scorpio energy. North Node and Pluto in the fourth house with Scorpio energy. Is your North Node and Pluto in Scorpio and all that is in the fourth house? Can you let me know? You're welcome. Ebony says, what do you think of North Node conjunct South Node sinistry feels so karmic? It is, yeah. It's like you probably knew this person in a past life. You always know people in a past life if they're in this lifetime, but it's like if you're very drawn to them, there's maybe some sort of energetic unfinished business. Um, maybe you guys dated in a past life. Like it really depends on the rest of your natal chart. But yeah, it's past life connection for sure. Okay, so you said you have it all in. Okay, so you have North Node and Pluto in Scorpio in the fourth house. Okay, this is what I'm going to say about the fourth house. I feel like the fourth house is one of the most important houses in terms of astrology as to what's happening in the air. Because it's like whatever happens with the fourth house, which is your IC. Can you confirm if your IC is also in the sign of Scorpio? So whatever happens with your fourth house, you guys, is affecting your midheaven. It's affecting your career. Okay, it's affecting your public image. So sometimes people don't have their career going in the way that they want. The reason for this is because there's something that took place in the fourth house that hasn't been resolved or something of the sort. So when you have, let's say, North Node in the fourth house and you have Pluto in the fourth house as well, in this particular situation, you could have gone through a lot of transformation, let's say, in terms of the home. Okay, And a lot of your purpose in this lifetime deals with the home. You could even be interested in working from home, something of the sort. Okay, When you have North Node and Pluto in the fourth house and then you have Scorpio in there. So you could be interested in things like working very much with energy. I was picturing even caretaker for you or something like um, early childhood educator, something of the sort where you're working basically with people, you're helping them, you're healing them, okay, because of the fourth house energy in there. And then Scorpio is healing, you're helping people transmute. Let's see what else are you guys seeing in here. Lucas says, Pluto, Sag in the 10th house, you have Chiron conjunct your midheaven and Pluto thoughts. So for you, you're going to go through a lot of transformations in terms of your career, in terms of your public image. Sometimes Pluto in the 10th house, okay, a few things can take place. You can transform through your job, okay, so that's one thing that can take place. You can also transform publicly. So like, let's say those people who are like celebrities and, you know, they go through like huge transformations in the public eye, very much Pluto in the 10th house, like Pluto aspecting this. And then you have Chiron in here. So for you, when you engage in this area, it's a very healing experience. That's what Chiron is all about. That's you. It makes sense. Yay. Oh my gosh. I'm glad that that resonated. You're welcome. Frequency of free says you have Mercury and Sun in Scorpio in the 12th house. Oh my gosh, there's two of you guys in here. Saturn and Pluto is in Scorpio in the 11th house. Scorpio was rough when you were younger. Yeah, Scorpio energy goes through a lot. Okay, Scorpio energy goes through a lot. So there's a lot of trauma. There is a lot of picking up on other people's things, internalizing them as your own, and then transmuting this energy. There's a lot of manipulation. Also, what I will say with Scorpionic energies, there's always something going on with the mother. So there's always something going on with the mother and in terms of even the feminine line. So basically a lot of the time Scorpionic people are healing feminine manipulation within the line and it can be so covert, like it can be so, so hidden is really what that is. And it's interesting because also you have Mercury and Sun in the 12th. Oh my gosh, you have a very psychic chart. You're probably super, super psychic and intuitive with Mercury and Sun in the 12th house. And then you've got Pluto and Saturn in the 11th house, super ahead of your time, like very, very futuristic ideas. You're welcome. North node in Leo in the ninth house. Okay, let's look at your south node because the south node is going to tell us where you're coming from. So if you have north node in Leo in the ninth house, your south node is going to be in Aquarius and it's going to be in the third house. So in a past life, you could have been a big fish in a small pond. Maybe you were the mayor in your town or maybe you ha you discovered something new because Aquarius deals with discoveries, creative expression in terms of your ideas. So maybe you did this in a past life okay, with the third house. Now we have North Node in Leo in the ninth house. You're basically here to express yourself creatively in the physical. Okay, so that's what Leo is all about. Being seen, you being on a stage, entrepreneurship can be something. It can be teaching, it can be acting, it can be singing. It could be YouTube, it really depends, right? You're on a stage, that's the thing. You need to be physically seen. And the ninth house is some sort of philosophical message, okay, that you are expressing to people, okay? Some sort of message, it's a larger, it's, it's a larger message, okay? It's some sort of philosophy. That's the thing with the ninth house. Ninth house goes off, basically questions themselves. They're always asking, right? What is my purpose here? What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? What is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of that? And that's kind of what pushes them onto their journey, right? Onto the journey of self-discovery, figuring out, you know, what is the meaning of things? That's ninth house. And then they come back after they've gathered their information and they teach it. That's the ninth house energy. So you could be interested in doing something like this. Let's 
let's see. Ebony says you have North Node in Cancer and you have Venus in there as well. Venus in Cancer, you're going to be very feminine in terms of your approach to relationships. So when I say feminine, we all have masculine feminine energies within us. You could be someone who's looking for like a traditional type of dynamic. You could also be someone who's kind of looking right away to create a home with your partner. You could even be someone who like moves in with your partner like as soon as you meet them, okay? It's very homey. It's the crab, right? The crab kind of walks around and they have the home on their back. That's the whole energy with Venus in Cancer. Also, what I will say for Venus and Cancer, though, something that can happen for these people is sometimes the dynamic with the mother or like an abandonment wound that's connected to the mother can be in the way of their in the way of their love lives. That's something that I've noticed with Venus and Cancer people. There's like something that takes place where it's like either they were emotionally neglected or they were like emotionally abandoned or something of the sort, and that's kind of holding them back. When it comes to relationships, that's just something that I've noticed with Venus and Cancer. And it's interesting because you've got Venus and Cancer and it's conjuncting your North Node, so your life purpose, okay, is going to be very Cancerian, okay, it's going to be once again very feminine, very nurturing, it's very like, um, different compared to South Node in Capricorn, because South Node in Capricorn is masculine in the sense where it's like, it could have been authoritative lifetime, it could have been hustle, 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 it could have been all about money, building, kind of also depends what house you have it all in, let me know what house you have everything in, you're welcome, Lucas says, you have 12th house stellium, sun, moon, mercury, Neptune, you feel like you're invisible. Okay, that's a huge thing with the 12th house, and it's like, I think there's several things that take place. It's kind of, I always think about this, and I'm like, is it the chicken or is it the egg? Because a lot of the time, 12th house people, when they're growing up, they tend to be invisibilized. Okay, that's a term that I heard from a psychologist, actually. He was basically saying how like, you know, and when I say invisibilized, he was like talking about how like sometimes people aren't heard. That's Mercury in the 12th house. Okay. So Mercury in the 12th house cannot be heard maybe by their family and all these sorts of things. And it's kind of like the throat chakra gets shut off as time goes on. So that's part of it. But then the other part of it is sometimes like, I feel like because 12th house people are very aware of the metaphysical planes, it's kind of like they also feel like people don't see them. Like, I don't know it's it's very much like they're operating out of body and because of this they also kind of feel like people don't see them so then it's like it turns into like the chicken and the egg right because then it's like people don't see you but then it's like you're also not being seen like it's really really interesting let's see you said interesting <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> you're welcome ebony okay user 561148 etc says what are impacts of eighth house cancer okay so Eighth house is the hidden house is the subconscious, okay? So when you have, okay, so there's so many things happening with the eighth house for everyone in their natal chart. It can tell you what kind of spouse you'll have. It can tell you what kind of dynamic you'll have after you get married or after you get into some sort of long-term commitment. It has to be a longer-term commitment. It can also tell you things like inheritances sometimes, the eighth house, depending on what's going on in there. It can tell you things to do with what's hidden, okay? That's the eighth house as well. So when you have cancer in the eighth house, okay, there could be something hidden that took place, let's say, with the mother, okay? Because cancer can deal with the mother energy. So it's like maybe there was something here that you didn't see in terms of maybe even manipulation because the eighth house can deal with manipulation. And then maybe that can be in the way relationships or your partnerships or maybe that or maybe in terms of your relationships and your dynamics so that could be something that takes place with the eighth house cancer may eve says no planet in your 12th house but it's under cancer energy what do i think okay so when you have 12th house in the sign of cancer you can unconsciously behave like a cancer that's something that can take place and that's another thing oh actually you had the eighth house in cancer so the 12th house what it can tell you overall when you look at your 12th house in your natal chart it can tell you how you unconsciously behave it can tell you so many things it can tell you how you unconsciously behave it can tell you maybe unconscious fears even the eighth house can sometimes tell you unconscious fears okay so maybe having the eighth house in cancer can also be like fears around codependency or being left alone or something of that sort same thing with the 12th house. So you unconsciously behave like a cancer when you have 12th house in the sign of cancer. So this means you're going to be very nurturing. You're going to be very loving. You're going to be very caring. That's cancer in the 12th house, okay, for it occupying basically the entire house. Let's see what else. Let me see what else are you guys saying in here. You also have a Pisces moon. May Eve, you're very like, when I tap into your energy, you're very like feminine, okay? You're very, you, I feel like you carry a lot of water as well overall energetically. Like you're very nurturing, you're very feminine, okay? That's the energy that I really pick up on. Frequency of Free says, for you, when you think you're being ignored and not seen, you manifest that shit in real life as a dollhouse person. Yeah, okay, that's a really cool thing you guys can do. Everybody can do this. 
But like, let's say you guys are going through an area or maybe like a sketchy person comes on, like, you know, let's say you guys are like somewhere and there's like a shady person that's like wandering around. You guys can like think it in your mind. You can be like, I'm putting like invisible energy around me so they don't see you. And actually that works. Okay, it actually works. Sun and Venus in Libra in the 11th. So you can meet your partner online with Venus in the 11th house. This is the thing that I think about sometimes with like online dating. And it's like, you hear people's horror stories about online dating, but it's like, then you look at people's natal charts and it's like, you're not meant to meet the person that you're supposed to be dating online. You know what I mean? So Venus in the 11th, you can meet them online. You can. Jupiter in the 11th can also be online as well. Let's say you're looking for a partner or something of that sort. Sun in the 11th, you're going to be ahead of your time. Okay, overall, the 11th house is very much ahead of your time. You can be very much even ahead of your time in terms of your relationships. You can be detached in the sense where it's like a healthy type of dynamic. You know, it's like you do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. But what I will say is like having Libra in there. Libra can struggle with being alone. Okay, they can also struggle with codependencies. They can always want to be. You know, okay, so having Libra in the 11th, it's like the 11th house is pulling you to be detached and kind of like you do your thing. I'm going to do my thing and we're going to meet when we meet. But Libra is going to be like, oh, I want to hold on to you and I want to be with you all the time. So just something to, I guess, keep in mind. You're welcome, A.E. I'm sending you the same energy. Okay, Lucas says, you're Venus in Aquarius first house. You met every single person you've had a relationship with online. Exactly. There you go. That's exactly what it is. Venus in Aquarius is very much meeting people online. Friendships online. That's another thing. Venus can also deal with your friendships. So when you have it in the 11th house or if you have it in Aquarius, you can meet a lot of friends online or you can have a lot of online friends, you know, things like this. So it's really interesting. What I like about astrology, you guys, is like, this is how I see astrology, okay? It's like you have a certain energy in your natal chart and it's like when you, yeah, <laughs> it is. It's awesome. Like, it's the best thing ever. So with astrology, it's like you have a certain energy in your natal chart, right? What happens sometimes is like you're going to have inner like desires or dreams and it's like it's aligning with your astrology, right? Because it's like the soul knows what it wants, but then there's all these other things that are taking place that can like be throwing you off. You know what I mean? It can be belief systems, programming, um, looking for the approval of others, things like this, right? And it's like on the inner level, the soul always knows, right? And most of the time you'll notice that people's inner desires are aligning with their astrology. It's like their higher self, you know? I was just talking about this with someone the other day as well. Okay, it's like, there's always like a guidance, you know what I mean? Like if you really, really want something, it's like sometimes the next thing in your life can't happen until you do that thing. Do you know what I mean? So that's what I love about astrology because it's like the energy is in your favor to do something. You know, if you have a certain amount of energy, it's like it'll be easier for you if you do that thing. You can do something else. Yeah, like let's say you have an abundance of 11th house energy in your natal chart and it's like very much favorable for you to work with the internet and these types of things and work online and let's say you try to do something that's different like that thing will probably still work out because at the end of the day like you still have free will and if you're persistent i mean at least i believe that you'll still get those things but why would you do that when it can be easier for you you know what i mean what else are you guys saying in here okay so p says you have cancer in the seventh house with your mercury and chiron what does that mean for for relationships you have cancer in your seventh house. Okay, so your descendant is in the sign of cancer. Very interesting. Cancer in the seventh house. Okay, this is the thing with the seventh house and the descendant, you guys. What can happen a lot of the time is like you can attract the shadow of that sign until you integrate that shadow within yourself in the beginning. Okay, so you might attract clingy people or you might attract codependent people or you could attract alcoholic type people or people who are uh, uh, addicts in one way, shape or form. Okay, that can take place with cancer in the seventh house, right? These types of things, escapism, or people who fear being alone or being abandoned, because it's like you kind of have that fear going on, right? You kind of have to overcome that. So you keep kind of attracting these people into your life. Oh my gosh, guys, thank you so much for the likes. So you have Mercury in here and you have Chiron in here. So Chiron being in here basically means that relationships are very healing for you. You heal through relationships. And then Mercury in the seventh, it can also mean that like, you know, you go to your spouse, let's say in terms a lot of things right you very much value their opinion or you can attract a partner that's very intelligent intelligent or intellectual or someone that's chatty or someone that's all about the mind or you could be looking for a mental connection with your partner as well having cancer in here cancer like okay the thing is with the cancer energy you guys this is what i'm gonna say all the signs have a shadow side and a light side and for whatever reason when we're like in the shadow of a particular sign it's kind of in the driver's seat until we realize it and until we bring it to the surface so when you have cancer in the seventh house, right, when it comes to your relationships, 
you yourself could maybe fear being alone or you settle or you're constantly looking for a relationship of some sort where it's like you settle for dynamics and maybe you end up in narcissistic dynamics because you're going to be very empathic. Maybe you're going to be over giving in your relationships or very nurturing. You could take on projects and things like this where it's like, oh, but I love this person. Like it's going to be very much about the emotions. You know what I mean? And that can sometimes take over the logical mind and things like this. So it's just a matter of integrating these things within you. Oh my gosh, you guys, thanks so much for the likes. Let me go back up and see what you guys are saying in here. Frequency of free said an astrologer told you to stay doing what your chart suggests. Exactly. Yes. That's what I would suggest for everybody. To do. It's like you're going to end up doing that anyways. That's what I'm going to say. You might as well not waste your time. It's amazing. We're living in a time where people are becoming so self-aware. You're like the lives are just easier. And it makes sense because it's like, okay, a few things are taking place because first of all, like people are doing a lot of inner work. So it's like the people who are birthing the next generations are more healed and aware. So then those generations are going to be healed and aware. And it's like your life can go very much more smoothly, you know, when you know what's in your favor instead of going against it, you know? Let's see what else you guys think in here. Scorpio and Chiron in the 11th house. That's a lot of healing um, with the Chiron in the 11th house. It could also be healing through sexuality. It can also be healing through um, the mind, okay, with the 11th house being in there or groups of people or friends, things like this. I'm just going back up. You struggle to believe that you're free will, but you believe we think that we're meant to have. Hold on, you said, yeah, that's why you struggle to believe your free will. But you believe we meant to think we have it. That's very interesting. I had someone ask me to make a video on free will. It's a little bit more complex, so I'm not going to take you guys into the crown chakra today. I'll just make a separate video on that. <laughs> at least on like what my thoughts are as of right now. Because it's like, when you look at astrology, that really is a question. Like, do we actually have free will? Do we? I don't know. Ebony says, is people with moon conjunct Chiron in Cancer 8th house also have mother issues? Yes. Okay, that's where I was going with the whole Cancer thing. Thank you for thank you for bringing me back to that. So what I'm going to say for Cancer is like Cancer placements, there's always something going on with the mother. There's always a deep love for the mother, whether the mother was there, whether the mother was not there. There's always something going on with the mother and there's always like with Cancerian energy. You're always looking for a mother figure or a mother role or like, you know, you might put people onto pedestal or like on pedestals that are like your managers or like someone to fill that mother role, whether the mother was there or not there. Or if the mother was there, then it's like it could even be emotionally incestuous. You know, what's something really interesting, actually, that I heard someone say once they're basically saying that, like, if you feel suffocated in relationships, it's because you could have had like an emotionally incestuous dynamic maybe with the mother or one of the parents. That's kind of what cancer gives me okay, energetically in terms of when it's in the shadow, right? It's like, it's this energy where it's like, it's, you need to create a space, okay, between the two people. Let's see what else you guys think in here. Oh my gosh, thanks so much for the likes, you guys. I'm going back up. But yes, for cancer energy, there's always something going on with the mother. Always, always, always. You said you're a sun in cancer, Jupiter in Pisces in the fourth house. Jupiter and Pisces in the fourth house. Okay, what I'm going to say for you, Tats D. Me, is that, you know, in terms of your career or your job or whatever you're trying to do, if it's not going the way you want, you're going to have to look at the house and the home because the fourth house is aspecting that, okay? It's opposing that energy. So it's like maybe something took place in the home when you have Pisces in the fourth house. Let me know if you have your IC in the fourth house because sometimes when you have Pisces in the fourth house, what can take place is like, you know, in the home, there's something that wasn't clear. Sometimes, okay. Pisces in the fourth house can go two ways. It can go in the divine version, which more often doesn't tend to happen because for whatever reason, it's just the way that it is, at least for now. But if it goes into the shadow, it can go into like the darker aspect. So the divine version of Pisces in the fourth house is an unconditionally loving home, a home that was very much all about the love and the high vibes and like the unconditional love to the point also where you can feel suffocated. But if it goes into the shadow, there could have been escapism. Something that I've noticed with Pisces in the fourth house is, or Pisces I see, which is having Pisces in the fourth house. These people can sometimes have homes where the parents weren't necessarily ready to have the child or children. They weren't ready to be parents, like something of the sort. And they kind of like checked out or they were like busy all the time. Like they were absent. Okay. There's an escapism energy. Also, there can be substance abuse within the home for Pisces in the fourth house as well. Just escapism of some sort that can take place. So that's the shadow version. So now you have Jupiter in here. Jupiter is all about the abundance. It's supposed to be expanding this area for you, right? So it's like, if it's not expanding, 
Well, you kind of have to look to see what's going on in the home. Are there belief systems around money that are in the way and these types of things, okay? Because overall, Jupiter in the fourth house and in Pisces, you could bring through abundance through the home, through real estate, through interior design maybe, because you have Pisces in there, through art of some sort, um, anything to do with like romance, romanticizing things. Oh my gosh, guys, thanks so much for the likes. Let's see. You said your parents are divorced and this breaks you... And this breaks you Pisces in the fourth house. There it is. There it is. Let's see what else you guys saying in here. Also, when you have Pisces in the fourth house, what you want to do is look at the moon too. The moon's also going to tell you a little bit more insight as to what's happening with the mother. Okay. So Lucas says Jupiter in Pisces first house tropical chart. Jupiter in Pisces first house. That's a nice energy. You can make abundance through the self. You can also make abundance through, you know, working like a physical type of job uh, where you're, you know, moving. <laughs> You have to be moving, okay? That's the whole thing with the first house. First house needs to be moving, okay? So, you know, this can be athletics, dance. It can be construction. It can be a retail job or whatever, like where you're walking around, you know? You put a first house person into somewhere where they have to sit for eight hours a day, it's not gonna work. That's the thing, you know? You're still gonna have that, like, need to move. And it's like, when you have an excess of first house energy within, then this can go into the anger. Do you know what I mean? Or it can even go into overthinking. Sometimes first house people, actually what can happen with them, or like Aries people, they can struggle with sleeping because they haven't burned enough of that Aries energy. They have to spend time burning the energy, okay? Whether it is maybe exercising after work or whatever it is, like let's say you do work at a job that's eight hours a day and you're sitting, you need to still burn the energy because it's gonna affect your sleep, okay? Because Aries also deals with the head. Okay, so P says, that makes sense for cancer. You have attractive people who are struggling in different ways. Yes, that does take place with the Cancerian energy. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, thanks so much for the likes, you guys. Gemini Sun in the sixth house. Very much healing energy, very mental. Okay, all about the mind. What else are you guys saying in here? Can you elaborate on Pisces Midheaven and presenting yourself on social media? Yes, absolutely. I also have a video on that on my YouTube channel. I'm just going back up to see if I missed anyone and I'll come back to you. Let's see. Gemini in the fourth house. Okay, so Gemini in the fourth house, this is your IC once again. So having Gemini in the fourth house, okay. The thing is with Gemini in the fourth house, so even if you have a Gemini moon, what tends to happen is one or both of the parents can be very emotionally immature. So a lot of the time, Gemini in the fourth house people, what happens is from a young age, these people tend to very much be like, kind of left to fend for themselves to like raise themselves you know they're kind of left to like figure things out on their own there could be a lot of people coming in and out of the house when you have gemini in the fourth house it can be very much like a home where there's a lot of family members coming through kind of like a revolving door that's gemini in the fourth house and then leaves the person to be curious okay so that's the thing with the gemini in the fourth house energy you're now curious to know about other people because of this because you've been you've been exposed to a lot of different types of personalities from a young age you're welcome let's see what you guys are saying in here so and saturn in the fourth house oh you also have saturn in the fourth house so that adds a whole different layer to the story so saturn in the fourth house these people sometimes okay this is what happens with saturn in the fourth house you guys these people are basically forced to grow up at a young age so sometimes you don't really have a childhood because you're forced to be well it's not forced no one's forcing you it just kind of happens okay that's the whole thing so with Saturn in the fourth house, it's like from a young age, what tends to happen is you guys tend to be very mature and it's like you kind of age backwards with Saturn in the fourth house. So you might have to take on a lot of responsibility from a young age. Maybe you take care of different siblings. Maybe you help the family with the business, whatever it is. Okay, there's some sort of either financial struggle or whatever it is where you guys are forced to mature from a young age. It's affecting the home and it's affecting the mother. So what happens for Saturn in the fourth house people, sometimes around the time their Saturn return comes, the first one at least, there's something that takes place that basically forces them to go back into the home, okay? And most of the time it deals with their jobs. So something takes place surrounding their job because of the 10th house oppositional energy. This is what I was saying to you guys even earlier with the fourth house, 10th house axis, okay? Because it's like, if there's something that's not taking place in terms of your career, there's the fourth house that's affecting it, okay? So because of this, right? You, let's say you stop working or you change your job or you lose your job or whatever it is. Something takes place where you now go back into the home, okay? Because you are now resolving issues surrounding the home. If it's not the actual home in terms of like parents, it can be whoever you're living with, okay? Maybe it's going to perpetuate throughout your relationships, this dynamic, okay? But you're basically healing the home with Saturn in the fourth house. Sometimes Saturn in the fourth house, people can 
take a while to get married or start a home or family of their own because you guys are clearing karma surrounding the home and also the mother. So I'd be curious to know what your moon is in as well, Derek, if you're still in here. What made me get into astrology? Yes, I have a video on that. You can check it out on my YouTube. It's called How I Got Into Astrology. I can talk about that for days and days and days. I'll get to that question shortly. So back to Sunny with the Pisces Midheaven and presenting yourself on social media. Okay, so the Midheaven, you guys, is all about how you present yourself to the world. It's how you want the world to see you, right? That's what the 10th house is all about. So social media is us presenting ourselves in a certain way to the world. So when you have Pisces in here, you're probably going to want to come off very caring. You're probably going to want to come off either artistic. Sometimes Pisces Midheaven can also have phases where they, where they have social media, delete it, have it, delete it, because they get overwhelmed. Because it's like with social media, you're absorbing a lot of energy. That's the thing. So when you have a Pisces Midheaven, you can go through this like push-pull of wanting to be on social media and posting all the time and all these things. And maybe you kind of go through like a phase where you post all the time, but you've absorbed a lot of energy. What I can suggest for Pisces Midheaven is like have a very directed focus in terms of what it is that you're posting because at least that way you're containing the energy because if you're too scattered energetically and you're posting all these things you have a lot of people connecting to your energy and then that kind of is like also part of the reason that you get tired okay and drained that's something also Pisces Midheaven can very much talk in riddles you know sometimes I see those pages where they like make like okay core core have you guys seen core core or like hope core and like all those things very much Pisces Midheaven. That's very much Pisces Midheaven. Kind of depends on like the core that they're doing. But that's very much Pisces Midheaven. You're making like a montage with a movie and music and it makes people feel something. That's Pisces Midheaven, okay? It's artistic. You're going to you're going to want to express yourself artistically in terms of your social media. If it's not that, you can be interested in like healing and helping people heal and talking maybe about healing and healing modalities and the metaphysical world and these types of things as well. Like it could even be psychic things and all these types of things. So those are a few things that can take place. Let's see, Derica says your moon is in Aries in the second house. Very interesting. So in terms of the mother, the mother could have been, um, okay, so we have Saturn in the fourth house. The roles could be reversed with the parents. That's another thing that can take place. So the mother can take on the father role. The mother can be the authoritative person in the home. And then you have Aries in there, which is also a masculine energy. So the mother can very much have been more masculine energy leaning as well. And the second house can be maybe the mother was all about building or maybe it was like a single mother household, something of this sort, okay, where there was a focus on money. You're welcome, Sunny. Okay, Tat Zimi says, your moon is in Sag in the first house. Your mother doesn't want another child, so you lived... Oh, your mother didn't... Wait, your mother didn't want another child? Or are you trying to say your mother didn't want a child? Because then you said, so you lived rejection in all your life. Yeah, having moon in the first house gives you the undertone of having a Cancer rising. All Cancerian people are abandoned in one way, shape, or form. And usually it's emotional abandonment, these types of things, or emotional neglect. Frequency of free says, so true, eight hour jobs. Yes, Sag to Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus in the first half. Yes, all of the feminine energy leaning signs and houses are going to struggle with something that restricts them because they're more so creative and they're more so going with the flow and they're more so feeling based, okay? So they're definitely going to struggle with these types of jobs. Let's see, what made me get into astrology? Um... Like I said, I have a whole video on that on my YouTube channel because like whatever I say now, like I talked about it for like, I think the video is like 20 minutes long. So I'm not going to like spend 20 minutes talking about it. But really, it was like one thing that led to the next. You know what I mean? I think it's because I'm like Scorpio dominant. I'm like very investigative. So I'm always trying to get to like the bottom of things. So I'm like, honestly, like, how did this person do this? Because it was all about like when I was younger. Well, actually, I'm Scorpio and Capricorn dominant. So when I was younger, I was like obsessed with being successful and putting it in this because like, what does that even mean anymore? Like, honestly. But yeah, so I was obsessed with that. So I would like research like these people that I deem to be successful. So I was like, how did they get to where they got to? Like, what did they do? And honestly, one thing led to the next and like, boom, I got into astrology. <laughs> Let's see what else you guys saying in here. You said your mom was super strict and your dad was immature and they split since you were 12. You had to parent your father so good. Someday you're going to read my chart. Yes, I will definitely read your chart for you. If any of you guys are interested in natal chart readings, you can definitely check out my website. Okay, if it's on TikTok, you guys can go in the link in my bio. If you're watching the replay on YouTube, it's going to be in the description box below. And yeah, it's going to be under the shop if you guys are interested. Okay, Tasty Me says, with Chiron in Scorpio in the 12th house. So you're healing through Scorpio-like things. You're healing through the 12th house as well. So what does all of this mean? It can be things to do with metaphysics, metaphysical plane, occult, occult knowledge, secret things, hidden things. 
all these wonderful things. Sexuality can be very healing for you. It can be a healing experience for you when you have Chiron and Scorpio. Art, artistic endeavors, emotions, feeling, like anything to do with basically the emotional world. It's the sacral chakra. That's what, that's what Scorpio deals with. So it's emotions, vulnerability. The thing is like Scorpionic people sometimes go into art, right? Because they might struggle to actually express their emotions. So they might, you know, draw or they might write music because of the 12th house, okay? Or they might write in general or they might paint or I'm seeing like those like um, pottery type things, like these types of things. Let's see what else are you guys saying in here? What else are you guys seeing in here? I'm just going back up. Jupiter, Pisces, and the third house. Jupiter and Pisces in the third house. So you can make money in abundance through speech, speaking, the written or the spoken word. You can make money through writing, social media. That could be another way that you make money. Pisces is going to have to be artistic, okay? It has to be some sort of creative expression through art. Let's see what else are you guys saying in here. Pluto first house that gives you the undertone of having a Scorpio rising. So people are either going to love you or they're not going to like you. Um, sometimes you might make people feel uncomfortable because you kind of see through them. That's the thing. Pluto in the first house is the undertone of having Scorpio rising. So you can take on some of these traits when you've got Pluto in the first house. You're going to be very Plutonian. That's the thing. You're going to be very transformational. You could just be a walking trigger for people. That's That tends to happen for Pluto in the first house as well. Sometimes I've noticed with Pluto in the first house people, they tend to say the perfect thing without even realizing because what happens with anyone who's psychic, what's happening is like they're taking information out of another person's unconscious without realizing sometimes. Sometimes it's like, I was going to say like, sometimes it's like even better when you don't realize because it's like you tend to say the perfect thing for that person. Do you know what I mean? Like something that they needed to hear. It could be just like one encounter that you have with that person. You took something and it's like healing for this person because you just happened to say something that they needed to hear at that time. Very much Pluto in the first house. Let's see what else you guys saying in here. Sag in the first house. Sag in the first house, that's the Sag rising. So you're very much going to be someone who is all about the adventures, adrenaline, you're going to be into like adrenaline rushes and bungee jumping and jumping out of a plane and like these types of things like that side in the first house. You can never catch these people like they're always doing something, something fun and adventurous and adrenaline. They, they tend to be adrenaline junkies. Also, it depends though, like it depends at what degree you have it because we do go through secondary progressions. So maybe it's, maybe if it's in the later degrees, you've progressed already and it might not resonate, but overall that's sad rising. Like they're very fun people. Okay. They're very intellectual. They tend to have like very defined quads. Okay. And buttocks area. That's very much sad in the first house. They can be athletic. They can be the types of people who are interested in extreme sports. These types of things. Okay. It's all about the adrenaline. Okay. For a sad person, travel, entrepreneurship, freedom. That's a thing. And also Sag energy, it does tend to be known as the lifelong bachelor as well. It doesn't mean you're not going to find anybody. It just means you need to find someone who understands this aspect of you. Saturn fifth house, Taurus late marriage. Okay, what I'm going to say about Saturn in the fifth house, it's very interesting because it's like you have Saturn in the fourth house, which can also be delayed marriage. It can also be delayed family, okay, creating a family, something of the sort. Same thing with fifth house. Fifth house Saturn, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that it's necessarily late marriage. What I will say for Saturn in the fifth house, it can mean delayed children. Or sometimes what happens with Saturn in the fifth house people, what I've noticed is sometimes they can have one child maybe around their Saturn return, but it's karmic. Okay, in terms of you're clearing karma with the partner of that child, and then maybe they can have a child way later on, like there could be a huge gap, or they can choose not to have children at all, Saturn in the fifth house as well. Okay, so those can be a few things that do take place. In terms of marriage, there's a lot of things to look for in your natal chart. We would have to look at the eighth house, we would have to look at the seventh house as well. Mercury and Taurus in the fifth house. Mercury and Taurus in the fifth house. So you think in terms of your creativity, you're going to be very logical, very practical. You're going to, you know, have like a slow and steady wins the race type of approach when it comes to your mind and expressing your thoughts and these types of things. You could be interested in money. You could be interested in luxury and you could be interested in investments. And again, you're going to be very practical when it comes to your mind. You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to answer this question and I'm going to sign off. So Lucas says Saturn second house Aries. Okay, so when you have Saturn in the second house, okay, for you, for everyone, okay, to understand, Saturn is the area that you're mastering in this particular lifetime. 
So <laughs> Sagittarius presence enters a welcome. So whatever area you have Saturn in, you're mastering that in this lifetime. And it's like that particular area could have been restricted for you by a father figure. Okay. Early on in life, if it's not the father, it can be the dominant masculine role. So there's something going on in terms of karma surrounding money and the values and belief systems that are connected to the paternal line. Okay. That's the whole thing. So it's like, maybe there was a pressure placed upon you from a young age. Okay. This is how you make money. This is how you go about making money, but it might not work for you. Cause it's like, you kind of have to pave your own path. You know what I mean? Saturn in Aries, the father can restrict your individuality, your expression, expression of the self, these types of things. You're welcome. All right, you guys, I'm going to sign off. I hope you guys enjoyed the live. I hope you all have a beautiful rest of your evening. Make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you're not already on there. It's called Barbara Talks. And once again, have a nice evening.